Question 8 says it's about tidal power, but really it's just a question about potential energy, I think. So the first part, calculate the mass of seawater covering an area of 120 km squared and depth 10 metres. It gives you the density. It's asking for the mass, so hopefully you realise that volume is going to come into this somewhere. So you really need to know what's the volume of water that's got an area of 120 km squared and 10 metres deep. Quite easy, provided you remember, of course, that you don't just take the 120 and times it by 1,000. One square kilometre is 1,000 metres times 1,000 metres. So that should help you to sort that one out and avoid the schoolboy errors. So when you found the volume, you know the density, you can find the mass. Second part, calculate the maximum loss of potential energy of the seawater in part one when it's released through the turbine. So you know what mass of water there is there, trapped above the turbines. It says the maximum loss, but it just means if, it's all, if all of it is lost. So if you know the formula for change in potential energy, you know the mass of water, you know the gravitational field strength, if you don't know it, it's on the data sheet. And then the, the missing thing is the height. So there's a little bit of thinking involved. All this water that starts out above the turbines, it finishes, finishes up coming through the turbines, it won't all have fallen through the same height, will it? Some of it starts level with the turbines, some of it is right at the top 10 metres above the turbines. So on average, it's not zero metres, that's the minimum value, it's not 10 metres, that's the top layer of water. On average, how high is the water above? One thing to think about. So for part three, potential energy of the seawater thing that you've just calculated is released through the turbines and it says it takes six hours for this to happen. So you've got to estimate the average power output of the power station over this time period. Assume the power station efficiency is 40%. So we know how much potential energy there is trapped in the water. We know that 40% of that the power station changes it to electrical energy. So we know how much electrical energy you've got and we know it takes six hours to do that. So if you can think back to the formula that links power and energy in time you can work out the power of the power station. Question 9 is about a crane lifting objects up. So we're going to be dealing with energy. Now one of the things that we notice about this is that it gives you details about the voltage of the motor and how much current the motor takes. So it looks as if you're going to be expected to work out things like electrical power and electrical energy. Now you can do that because you did it in Unit 1, but it isn't part of Unit 2. So I don't think you'd be asked a question quite like this on the new syllabus. This must have come from an older syllabus. It was, it's 2005 before the syllabus changed. Because there, there could be some students somewhere in the country who will be doing Unit 2 before they've done Unit 1. So you can't ask, ask for knowledge that you don't get without doing Unit 1. But anyway, we've done Unit 1. So, what do we know? We know the mass of the object. We know that it's lifted 5 metres. So hopefully we can work out how much potential energy it's given. We're then told it takes 22 seconds to give that much potential energy. So we can work out how much potential energy is given every second. And hopefully we know that energy per second, the rate at which energy is transferred, the amount of energy given per second, has a name. To calculate the efficiency of the winch, well, if we know, we may as well say the word, if we know the power of the winch, the mechanical power, the rate at which it gives, it gives potential energy, to find the efficiency, we need to compare it with the electrical power that goes in. It tells us the voltage and it tells us the current. So we should be able to work out the electrical power and then hopefully you'll find that the electrical power is more than the mechanical power because you can't be getting out more than you put in and you can work out the efficiency. Right, the second part basically put in a completely different topic squeezed in because this is about young modulus. It tells you the area of the cable and it asks you to calculate the strain in the cable when it raises the object at constant speed. The constant speed bit, of course, that tells you that the object's in equilibrium. So the upward force in the cable must be equal to the downward force on the object. And of course, the downward force on the object is its weight. And if we know its mass, and we know the gravitational field strength, we can find its weight. So therefore, we know what the tension in the cable is. So we now know the force in the cable, and we know the area of the cable, and force divided by area is what we call stress. So we know the stress in the cable. And then we're asked to find the strain, and it tells us the young modulus. So at this stage, hopefully you remember it, but if you don't, you can look up on the data sheet the Young Modulus formula. And here's the Young Modulus formula, tensile stress divided by tensile strain. Don't worry too much about the tensile bit, that just means it's been stretched. It's stress divided by strain. And we've already worked out the stress, we know the Young Modulus, so we can use that formula to find the strain. So stress divided by Young Modulus will give us the strain. The last bit, it tells you the length of the cable to begin with, 14 metres. 
and it asks you to find the extension of the cable. Well, we already know what the strain is, so we just calculated it. And we know the original length, so provided we know what strain means, and there wouldn't be much point working out if we didn't know what it meant. Check the data sheet. Does the data sheet tell you what strain means? No, it doesn't. So you've got to know it. So assume that you do know what strain means, and you know the strain, and you know the original length, then it's very simple to put the values in and to get the, the change in length, the extension of the cable.